it comes to choosing the right parts for your next gaming PC, some components are just plainly easier to pick than others. But choosing the right motherboard can be particularly complicated. With so many different CPU sockets, chipsets, form factors and features, it can be really difficult to discern which boards you should buy and which boards you shouldn't. Should you go as cheap as possible to maximise the money left for a CPU or GPU upgrade, or is actually spending a little more on a motherboard really worth it? Let's talk about it. The Corsair Frame 4000D is here and better than ever. With a spacious and fully modular design, you can configure this case to meet your build's exact needs. Improved airflow at the front and on the side helps to keep temperatures down, while Corsair's new InfiniRail mounting system allows you to adjust fan rails for added versatility and a cleaner aesthetic. What's more, it's compatible with reverse connector motherboards, 360mm all-in-one radiators, and comes with an integrated GPU anti-sag arm. Learn more and check it out at the first links in the description below. Now I'm going to split today's video down into a few key sections and you can use the timestamps below to navigate through them as you wish. Now let's start off with form factors. Motherboards range in size from the smallest mini ITX like this ROG Strix X870i right through to what you call the E-ATX or extended ATX protocol. Micro ATX boards sit somewhere in the middle while your standard size ATX boards are still the most common and most popular for a normal gaming PC build. Choosing the right form factor motherboard is actually way easier than you might think. You're only really going to pick yourself up a mini ITX motherboard if you're really bothered about having a small form factor build. I know that some people just don't want their gaming PCs to be large and that's where you'll need to get a smaller mini ITX board. The main trade-off with the mini ITX form factor is its size. While it's useful for obviously keeping your build nice and compact, it just doesn't leave much available PCB space for extra connectivity and expansion. You want to add additional PCI cards or loads and loads of SSDs, this isn't the board type for you. Now, some boards will get around this, like Asus have done here, by building up the PCB and actually stacking connections on top of each other. And on some boards, not this one, but some, you'll also find an M.2 slot installed around the rear to, again, expand the storage options. You'll also often pay more for a mini ITX board, as they're a bit more niche and more expensive to design. And even though you're getting less PCB for your money, it's more of a technical challenge to actually produce. The standard ATX size is what most most people are going to go for. And if we compare this side by side with our mini ITX board, you can see that the size difference is really quite remarkable. The ATX form factor is the most common, it's often the most cost effective, and is what most of you watching this video are probably going to go for. There is a board size that fits in the middle called Micro ATX. And Micro ATX boards are an interesting beast because they sit as a bit of a middle ground. Often on the very low end, they can provide good value for money. But a lot of the cases nowadays are either embracing the mini ITX or full size ATX form factor, meaning really the size and money you save may not translate into the case choice that you go for. The extended ATX form factor is really reserved for high-end enthusiast boards. For the vast majority of uses, it's just simply overkill. Now make sure to check the compatibility of the case you want to go for with your motherboard. Every case will have a number of specified board sizes, and I typically recommend, unless we're talking about eATX, that you go for the biggest supported size. A micro ATX board in a standard ATX case can look silly, and a mini ITX board inside a case that isn't mini ITX by design can just look particularly stupid and makes no sense from a cost and value point of view. Now one thing that all these boards have in common is their sockets. Now both of these boards here are AMD motherboards and both both support for the AMD AM5 socket. Now the socket on the board determines the CPU you can use. If you've already decided the CPU and GPU combo for your build, which by the way is a great place to start, then it's more likely that the CPU will determine what motherboard you can use rather than the other the way around. For AMD, the AM5 socket's really flexible because you get support for AMD Ryzen 7 and 9000 CPUs. AMD have also said they're going to support this socket for years to come, meaning that the Ryzen 10,000 or whatever they call it, which will probably land in another 12 or 18 months, will also support these boards with a compatible BIOS update. Now let's take a moment to talk about that BIOS. It's a word that's banded around lots in the motherboard space, but what does it actually mean? Now the BIOS on the motherboard is basically the way of of tweaking your PC settings before you get into Windows. It stands for Basic Input Output System and is something you'll find on every board design. The main thing that you'll see referred to on sites like PC Part Picker where it says this motherboard may need a BIOS update is if you've gone for a slightly older, say AM5 design but with a newer CPU. Updating the BIOS is a process of actually getting the motherboard ready to handle the new CPU and understand how it works. Most motherboards nowadays, particularly modern ones, have BIOS flash functionality which means you can update the BIOS without any CPU 
you installed. That's great for giving you that good forward compatibility, but some of the cheaper boards will not have this functionality. So be aware when you are buying, if your CPU is not compatible out of the box with the motherboard and requires a BIOS update, make sure the board that you pick has that BIOS update compatibility. Now, once you've determined the motherboard you need based on the CPU socket that's required, you're then going to want to look at chipsets before deciding on the exact model that you're after. AMD have three tiers to their chipsets and Intel is similar. AMD currently have their high-end X870 and X870 E boards, followed by their B850 and B850 E boards. And finally, the B840 chipset, which sits right at the bottom. Historically, the higher-end chipsets were differentiated by both their number of PCI lanes, more on that in a moment, and their overclocking support. AMD have turned that on its head a bit because their high-end X and B series chipsets support both CPU and memory overclocking. Intel, on the other hand, requires you to have a Z series top-end chipset board if you want to overclock the CPU and the RAM. But the big one with the chipsets is PCI lanes, bandwidth, and features. Now, the number of PCI lanes that you get on a motherboard chipset combines with the number of PCI lanes that you get on your CPU. This determines the amount of bandwidth and data that can be transferred around the motherboard. Now, when you install your graphics card, that's instantly going to swallow up at least eight, but more likely 16 lanes of PCI bandwidth. The PCI bandwidth that's left is then divvied up between other expansion ports on the board. Say, for example, you want to install a network or sound card in one of the additional PCI slots, or you want to go ham and install loads and loads of M.2 drives, all of that is going to swallow up PCI bandwidth. Higher end motherboards that have more PCI lanes also marry up, generally speaking, with better connectivity. On the higher end boards, you'll typically get faster Ethernet connectivity, more widespread USB 4 support. You're going to see things like Wi Fi 7, that's pretty widespread actually with all of AMD's new motherboards boards, but you get the picture. The more you spend, the higher the chipset on the board, the more features there are available. That's the reason that MSI's ludicrously expensive godlike board couldn't be a B850 design, because simply put, there just isn't enough PCI bandwidth for the features MSI would integrate on the lower end chipsets. Let's talk about features, because that's really the big one. Now, for people that are gaming, there aren't that many features you need to look out for. You definitely want RAM overclocking support, as that will allow you to tune the memory up to the rated speed. That's crucial when it comes to gaming performance performance in terms of RAM speed and latency. You also want to look out for memory support. All of the modern motherboards designed for the latest Intel and AMD generations are DDR5 only. Some motherboards will support faster kits than others, so check this. And ITX boards will often only have two RAM DIMMs, again down to space, where your ATX boards will have four. Preferably to make room for upgrades, you want four RAM DIMMs. And if you're going on a cheaper board, try and pick one up that still has four on board. And you'll also want to look at the PCI and M.2 slots. Now the PCI slot is is a much bigger deal than it used to be. We're now on PCI generation 5.0, and that's widespread on all of AMD's new boards and the vast majority of Intel's new boards too. You also want to then check the number of M.2 slots and the speeds of these slots. Now on this rather lovely Aorus board, the top slot up here is labeled as a gen five slot, meaning it supports the latest super fast SSDs. The remainder of these slots are only PCI generation four. Now, if we look closely on the markings here, you can actually see how these slots are wired up. So this top gen five, slot is labeled M2A underscore CPU, meaning it draws on the PCI lanes we talked about from the processor. The next slot down is also labeled CPU, meaning it too draws from the CPU. But the third slot is actually labeled M2C and draws from the chipset. And this is what we're talking about when it comes to the chipset, unlocking bandwidth and unlocking features. M.2 slots are backwards compatible. So a Gen 5 slot will still work well for a Gen 4 and a Gen 3 drive, but you're not forwards compatible, meaning you will not get the speed on offer from a fast Gen Gen 5 drive if you install it in a slower Gen 4 slot. You're limited by the maximum speed of the connector rather than by the device. You also want to check for things like M.2 heat sinks. The M.2 drives nowadays are getting hotter and hotter and it's important that you actually have an appropriate amount of cooling for the drives. It's why on this board the Gen 5 drive has a much bigger heat sink than the Gen 4 drives to reflect the increased output of heat. The rear I.O. connectivity is another big thing to talk about and something people often get really wrong when picking a board. Now let's take this mini ITX board for starters. It's a small board, but it's quite high end. And as such, you get some high end USB 4 support here. This one here has actually got a 10 gigabit slot on the bottom and a 40 gigabit slot on the top. Alongside, of course, support for the latest and greatest Wi-Fi 7 and a two and a half gigabit ethernet. Compare this to our slightly cheaper B850 Aorus board. And you can see ethernet, we still have two and a half gigabit, but our USB 4 ports have pretty much disappeared. And all of our high speed USBs are type A's with only really a token 
Ethernet-driven USB Type-C connector. This board also notches down to Wi-Fi 6E, which is going to drop your Wi-Fi speed slightly if you've got a compatible router. But what really matters? Now, the main thing is looking at your use case. If you're only using the system for gaming, these 10 gigabit per second USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports are going to be more than enough. And we've still got a high-speed USB Type-C on the rear and a front panel USB Type-C connector. Wi-Fi 6E is also plenty quick enough and 2.5 gigabit Ethernet is rapid by modern internet standards. So you're going to be fine. But if you're video editing, you're connecting up to a NAS and you need high-speed Ethernet, or you're, for example, ingesting lots of footage from loads of external drives, that board just isn't quite going to cut the mustard. The main ones really to look out for, though, are Gen 5 support for your M.2 and PCI slot. You want at least one Gen 5 NVMe slot, as well as things like the CPU and memory overclocking support. Most people don't tend to overclock their processors nowadays, but RAM overclocking is a much more crucial thing to make sure your board has. Which brings me nicely onto my recommendations for motherboards that I think you should consider for a gaming PC in 2025. Now, Gigabyte have a particularly nice range of B850 boards, and they do their white motherboard lineup really well. This B850 Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7 ICE is really nice. It boasts a fully white design, which is great for those themed gaming PC builds, and gives you Wi-Fi 7 support out of the box, while of course supporting, without the need for a BIOS update, all the latest Ryzen 7 and 9000 lineup of CPUs. If you want to go a little higher end, MSI's Edge lineup is really nice. Again, they do this in both Z890, so your Intel, but also X870 flavors. And while this doesn't quite embrace the white theme as much as what you'll see on Gigabyte, they're still really, really good looking designs. If you want a black themed motherboard, the MSI Carbon lineup is always a really sensible bet. While the Asus Tough range has gone a little more premium, but offers you good features at price points that, at least by Asus standards, aren't quite going to break the bank. ASRock are also an often overlooked brand for those of you buying motherboards. I really like their cheap range, their Pro RS series, like this last generation but super budget oriented A620 Pro RS Wi Fi. ASRock are particularly good for offering Wi Fi variants of their low end boards. It's another feature people often miss out on cheaper designs. They end up buying like really crap USB dongles. Please don't do that. Just pay the extra and get it on the motherboard. And ASRock tend to do, on the whole, a pretty good job of giving you that functionality on boards that won't break the bank. I'll link some of my favorite boards down below for the respective AMD and Intel chipsets for latest pricing on Amazon and Newegg around the world so you can see how they stack up. Let me know what parts you're going to pick for your gaming PC and hopefully today's video has helped to demystify the world of motherboards just that little bit. If you enjoyed it, please get subscribed. Thanks for watching and as always, I'll see you in the next one.